We welcome you to the main classroom in our university, and we want to thank Dr. She has arrived this morning and is leaving tonight to Canada. She has arrived at 10 a.m. and she is flying back at 1 a.m. in the morning. So especially we want to thank Tamara Weiss for being with us here today and to the University of Haifa and Carlos and Liliana who are coordinating this activity. And to them, because of them, uh, we have this activity to be possible here today in our university and to have this speech, which is a delightful speech, and to Dr. Shankar, who is in charge of uh, the postgraduate study, which we have here in the university with um, um, in coordination with the APA, and who has helped to have this uh, opportunity to have this professor here today with us. And after having the, um, this speech here in the university, we will have the opportunity to have a Q&A session about the expertise that uh, the doctor has uh, in the subject that she is presenting here today. She studies uh, with children with uh, different abilities and the impact of technology in the therapy. Also, it's a novelty, uh, the implications that this have in uh, patients with autism and also the integration and inclusion of this patient to work with this uh, patients with these pathologies to bring a better quality of life and integration and integration into the schools. I also want to thank two professors and um, students which are here today and to members of other institutions as the University of Buenos Aires, the Hospital Gutierrez, and students of other institutions who were in class and decided to come here today. And also students of PhD that are mixed here today and are present in this presentation. And also I want to um, apologize for the lack of seats here today, but, but primarily we, we thought that there were, were not going to be so many people today in this classroom. And actually we are happy to have all of you, but we apologize for lack of seats. Do you want to uh, speak your, your, you, Carlos, uh, as we wait for the other speaker? Good evening to everybody. My name is Carlos Fuchs. I'm uh, the press pres presiding with Liliana Gurman, the um, Asociación de Amigos de la Universidad de Haifa. I want to present to all of you what is the University of Haifa. It's the biggest of Israel. It has 20,000 students, many schools, and it's a very special project because what the um, university uh, implies is the possibility of multi multiculturalism and within the university uh, live together um, people that are Muslims, that are Jewish, that are uh, Catholics, and who are studying with civils, with soldiers, and really, the philosophy of this university is that if we can um, keep the peace within the university when we are studying all together, this is also possible to um, happen in the real world. Besides this philosophy, in Latin America, our philosophy is not only to have uh, our people coming here to speak, but also our idea is to have projects in common. Our idea is that professionals well, coming from Haifa can interact with professionals here in Argentina. And as a result, that this could uh, imply projects to be um, worked together. This is what, um, briefly, is the university for us. And uh, I know that all of you are waiting to um, hear Tamara speak. So I just want to thank Gabriela uh, for opening the doors of the university from day one. University. I did to bring Tamara here not very long ago. And Mr. Vichakar is the middleman. And we were studying two projects with Tamara that have not been known. I do recommend that to you. It is a project which includes children with special needs among regular children and 
the integration we see there is extraordinary. This school started back in 1990. It has done uh, advertising. It's an enormous school. It's in the district of Belgrano, and it was fantastic to see the interaction among all the children. Then in Tewel, we've been seeing the bridge project. And now I give the floor to Moti. Do you know, I don't need mine. I'm going to be standing. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm going to be standing. I'm going to be standing. I'm standing. I'm going to be 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 standing. We were expecting two other people. They apparently got lost. They really didn't know where to come, and now they're with us, fortunately. It is a real pleasure to open this first meeting between Haifa University and the University of Salvador, USAL. And this idea is because friends from Haifa University started to develop and think of projects in Argentina. And while I was in Haifa, and when the vice dean came over here, I proposed not to organize enormous conferences, but rather very specific projects because I was certain that USAL, this university, because of the way we work, I was certain that this is the policy we follow all the time, not only to communicate knowledge, but apply that knowledge and do the follow-up of such knowledge. So we tried to think of the adequate topic for a project. And together with Mr. Carlos Fuchs and Liliana Wutman, we were thinking that possibly working with uh, very much impaired and autistic children would be excellent for a common project. So we spoke to the dean and the vice president of the University of Haifa, and this is how we started to think how we could exchange knowledge in general in Argentina. There's a trend to underestimate or sometimes overestimate things. But to tell you the truth, Argentine professionals have a lot to give overseas and a lot to receive from overseas in this specific case, and we visited the two institutions today, from the point of view of uh, education, of human resources, and the idea of working with human beings, we have a lot to give. But from the technological point of view and the way we articulate one thing with another, I believe we have a lot to learn. This is why we invited Professor Tamara Weiss to come and let me tell you that Professor Wise has just been appointed the main lecturer at the pediatrics conference in Iwasu. She landed this morning, and when she ends this meeting today, she will be flying to Canada. And it's a real honor, and we're very thankful for her to be here with us. Professor Tamar Weiss is full professor at Haifa University. And we met today with uh, the dean and the vice president of USAL University and the dean of the University of Buenos Aires, Professor Nidia Carbone, uh, was, uh, had also been invited, but she was unable to come. But she sent two representatives, Licenciado Fariño and Clara Schechman, 
who is with us today on behalf of the University of Buenos Aires. So the idea then is to work jointly in these shared projects. And also with INECO, we hope to work together too. Professor Tamar Weiss lives in Canada, and she first studied occupational therapy and she was granted her BA in Canada. Then she did her master's course in uh, physical therapy, and then she has a PhD in biomedical engineering and zoology, and a postgraduate course and PhD in the technological adaptation to different types of situations. In Israel, and also internationally, she is one of the best known experts in applying uh, this type of technologies in the education of children at every level, but also of adults and a rehabilitation in uh, individuals with uh, uh, special problems in ne neurological impaired children, autistic children, and cerebral palsy children. Professor Weiss will give her presentation, but then there will be time for a Q&A session. And she will then wrap up after the questions. Let me thank the Dean and Licenciado Fuchs and Mrs. Liliana Gutmann for meeting them. Well, it's a pleasure to know them now and see how they work so, so hard. And thanks to them, we are all meeting here. Professor Weiss, the floor is yours. I have no, my mic here. No, no. Uh, yeah. You can hear? Can you all? Everybody's okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I, my apologies to begin with for speaking in English, but you have a choice of English or Hebrew. I assume that you and the translators would prefer English. I apologize that I do not know Spanish, uh, but I was very impressed with the simultaneous translation that I only clued into halfway through. Uh, so I hope that those of you who do not know English will be able to follow it through the translation. Thank you. Uh, I'm very honored to be here. Uh, it was a difficult trip. It was a long trip, but I think it was really a worthwhile trip. And I hope that um, what I'm able to share with you, you will get some benefit from. I hope that we'll have enough air to last us for the hour or so of my talk. Uh, I would like to sincerely thank the warm, warm hospitality that I've been shown in this one day uh, quick, quick trip. Uh, I thank uh, Dean Professor uh, Gabriela Renault for, your, for hosting the event. I thank um, Professor Licencia uh, Carlos Fuchs and to Professor Moti Benyakar and to Liliana Boardman for facilitating everything. And I also would like to thank the two schools that uh, hosted the visits today. They were really fascinating and heartwarming. I have the names written down, but I think I would mispronounce them. So I do thank you very, very much for that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit slower than I normally do, uh, <laughs> because I know it's being translated. Uh, I have a lot of material. We'll see how it goes. I don't mind being flexible in terms of what I present. I just want to turn on my timer so that I know how I'm keeping track. And uh, I hope that you'll uh, get some benefit from the presentation. Um, as, a, as Professor Benyakar said, I'm going to be speaking about different ways that we can use technologies. Some of them are new. Some of them have been around for a while already. Um, but we don't always get to benefit from them in therapy. And I'd like to show you a little bit about that. 
so what I'm going to start with is an overview of uh, some spe specific technologies, virtual reality. I'm going to talk a little bit about terminology so that we're all on the same page and then talk a little bit about the continuum of technologies because virtual reality is not just one technology, it's a whole family of technologies and talk a little bit about the pros and the cons, the limitations and what we call in English the affordances, the characteristics of technology that we make uh, use of in therapy. I'm going to then talk about a couple of different example populations uh, and show one example of cognitive rehabilitation uh, with a population of children with attention deficit disorders. Uh, motor rehabilitation, I'm going to use cerebral palsy as an example. Social interaction, I'm going to use autism spectrum disorder as an example. And I'm going to talk about how they illustrate the use of the different technologies. Uh, to briefly examine the evidence for their use and to highlight some of the current issues related to those technologies. And then, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm making some, okay, I guess I don't need to look at the time, just let me know how it's going. Uh, and then have some concluding remarks um, towards how to make the right clinical decision about which technologies to use. Um, I'm going to start off with a little bit of an overview. I don't know my audience, so I don't know really how many of you have for clinical background, a show of hands, clinical background, different kinds of therapies, medicine, etc. Okay. Psychology? Okay, fine. Anything else? <laughs> Education? What? Students. Students. But students of what? Psychology. Of psychology. Oh, that's, that's psychology background, I would assume. Okay. Uh, so my, f my own field is in neurologic, neurological rehabilitation and we're basically what we're aiming to do is to assess and to use intensive therapy in order to help the people that we work with, whether they be children or adults, participate more in their daily life activities. And we do that by aiming to improve their motor, cognitive and metacognitive abilities because those abilities are part and parcel of almost every activity that we do. And there are many examples of that related to the balance of somebody, I guess we should have announced to turn off phones, uh, range of motion, strength and endurance, social interaction, and attention and dexterity. Those are just a few examples of the kinds of deficits that we're aiming to help people improve. So the major goal, am I going okay? Okay, fine. The major goal in rehabilitation is to increase the level of interaction with the environment and at the same time aiming to decrease impairments and maximize a return to community life. We're looking at that intersection. Um, there are several key, very important principles of neurorehabilitation, and this has got a very rich literature. There's just a few examples of, of uh, references there. But following a neurological deficit, be it any of the conditions that I mentioned before, or as well as adult problems such as stroke or acquired brain da uh, damage, um, we want to aim for task-specific pr uh, practice, giving the people that we're working with opportunities to practice the skills that they're working on. High intensity, repetitive exercise is also very important. Activities that can be graded to be demanding yet feasible. So I don't know if you're familiar with the expression, um, use it or lose it, no pain, no gain. We always have to work a little bit harder than is comfortable for us in order to get any improvement. We all see that if we go to an exercise room and that's more so for people who have rehabilitation needs. We want to give people opportunities to work in varied, meaningful and purposeful environmental context. In other words, you're not going to give someone an exercise such as this. You want to give them something that would involve driving or involve shopping or involve activities of daily living that what really are the person's aiming to work on. And then finally, we want to increase the client empowerment and participation. In other words, we're not the therapists who are driving the process. The people that are in need should be together with us driving the process. It's very important, I think, across all of the different professions, including psychology, therapy, medicine, etc. If the client is not on board, then the process is not going to be as useful. Now, what does virtual reality have to do with all of that? I wanted to first of all define it for you. 
So um, basically, there is a computer has to be involved. The computer is running software. Um, now that takes us as far as gaming. You can have many kind of games on running on software. The, the difference that it, uh, is made by the fact that you have virtual reality is that you have various sensors which can be, for example, uh, tracking the head movements of a person. Or they could have a handheld tracker. Or they could wear a glove or have wearables on them. Or they could have a camera that's facing them. There are many types of technologies that are available today which will feed back into the environment and make changes in that environment which are then relayed back to the person that's using the system. In other words, there's a circle of interaction that goes between the user and the environment which makes the whole process very active. And in fact, what it really does is that it, I'm just going to go ahead for a second, it aims for, sorry, the concept of virtual presence. When we're using virtual reality, we're trying to give a personal experience of behaving in the virtual environment as if we are behaving in a real environment. And this doesn't mean that we're trying to fool anybody. People know that they're in a virtual environment, and yet, because they get this augmented, augmented feedback, they respond in a much more um, at an emotional level. They have increased motivation. That leads to enhanced performance. And in fact, all of these different factors add on to each other. Now, I'm going to just go back again a couple of slides. OK, I want to just illustrate the power of virtual presence within a virtual environment. And I'm going to show, do that by take, showing you a look at an example of just regular therapy. What you have here, this is an occupational therapist who is working, I'm going to remove the sound there, who is working with a client um, who suffered a spinal cord paraplegic injury. That means that the person has lost the use of their trunk muscles uh, and as well as their leg muscles. So they're confined to sitting. And um, what they have to do now is to learn how to maintain their sitting balance in order to be able to transfer from a regular wheelchair to a bathroom wheelchair, to transfer to bed to get dressed. Now, the, what the therapist is doing there is she's presenting rings which are requiring the uh, patient to reach out to disturb their equilibrium during sitting, and then to learn how to respond to that. What you and I do automatically by using our trunk muscles, this person can't do. Now, what's the problem with this kind of therapy? It could be boring, right? All they, the person has to change out. And let's face it, it's boring. A lot of what we do in therapy is boring. And that, well, the problem with that is that it leads to decreased compliance with therapy. And because of what I said before about the rehabilitation principles, you have to have repetitive, intensive exercise in order to achieve something. So if the person is not compliant to their therapy, they're not going to continue to practice. Okay, there's a, ha a big uh, question mark here about how related reaching out for a ring is to real life activities. Real life activities are much more dynamic. You have to reach, you have to respond, you're gonna fall down otherwise. Um, it's very difficult to grade the level of difficulty because the therapist is only a person. She can't run around like mad and present five rings at the same time. Um, and then there's very minimal documentation. Those of you who are therapists and even psychologists, I presume, have the same problem in therapy. It's very hard to take time from your therapy to actually write down what you did and to record the results so that you compare them and demonstrate to your hospital administration when they're asking for proof that what you did actually works. And so because of all of these issues, we then aim for virtual reality. I do want a little bit of sound here. Okay, so now we have here a similar uh, patient. It's not the same person. Um, I don't know how much, I'll, get, I'll try it a little bit. I don't know, how, I just want you to hear a little bit about the music. Okay. How, do you hear that? Okay, it's enough. I don't want to overwhelm myself, but I think there's too much feedback. I think we won't do it. Um, 
What you have here is a person with the same level of spinal cord paraplegia that we had in the previous slide. But what he's doing, he's facing a camera. It's, it's just too much feedback. Uh, he's facing a camera, and so he's able to see himself. He's not at home, right? He's now in the Alps. And he sees all of these uh, virtual stimuli presented at him. They can be graded to be any level of difficulty in terms of coming faster, coming many at the same time. You can see that he's highly compliant. He's made this whole thing into a game. And he's reaching out, he's working on his balance in a much more enjoyable way. And everything that you see there is fully documented. It's automatically recorded because it's all run by a computer. Just want to go a little bit ahead. Okay, now he's the goalie in a soccer game. Now, one thing I've managed to learn in my stay in Brazil and Argentina is that soccer is a very motivating, even if you're just a watcher of it, uh, activity. And so what he's doing, he's the goalie in a soccer game. He has to repel those balls. He has to reach out his arms. Those of you that are therapists in the audience will appreciate how hard he's working with his deltoid muscles here. So he's not only working on sitting balance, he's also working on strengthening and increasing the endurance of his upper extremity. Now he's getting knowledge of performance. He's seeing himself, he's seeing what his balance is like, he's seeing his arm position. He's also getting knowledge of results. I don't know how well you can see up here, but he's getting a score. He's also getting visual feedback as well as auditory feedback. There's ambient crowds of the cheering, of the cheering crowd here. And now it's, it's another day. There's therapists in the background. We never promote virtual reality to be instead of the therapist. And what you can see now that he's quite fatigued. We're actually using this beyond what is therapeutically recommended uh, because we wanted to just see how compliant someone could be. Now he, got, he be started to become very, very fatigued in his upper extremity muscles. And so what does he do? We learned how flexible virtual reality can be. You'll see it in just a moment. He's just too tired to lift up his arms anymore. So what does he do? Now he's using his triceps muscles and it's actually quite appropriate for soccer, isn't it? To do a <laughs> even more appropriate than using his arms, perhaps. The, the therapist at the side there is a little bit nervous, so you keep seeing her hand come into the field of vision. OK? So in, you, if you contrast what we see here with what we saw in the previous conventional therapy, you can see that there is a tremendous improvement in terms of the ability to comply with the, principle, the principles of rehabilitation. So you have task-specific practice. You have high-intensity, repetitive exercise. You have knowledge of both performance and results. You have incre increased client participation. He decided how long he could go on for. It was highly motivating for him. The activities could be much more easily graded to the, be demanding for the person, but yet not too demanding. And they were given in varied, meaningful, and purposeful contests. And I'll be showing you a number of other examples throughout my talk. So you will see just the, the variety of different activities that you can give. And of course, everything is completely documented because it's all on the computer. OK, we already went through presence. OK. now. I'd like to also tell you what virtual reality does not have to be. Take a look at this video and just look at how encumbered that person is. They've got a big head mounted display on them. They're wearing special gloves that give them a sense of touch. They've got a foot pedal. They've got a lot of equipment on them. When people thought of virtual reality, this is what they used to think of and it doesn't have to be like that. Contrast that with what we just saw of the person in the previous video, where he doesn't have anything on him. There's just a video camera that's putting him into the environment, okay? So we're aiming to get away from encumbrance and go towards flexibility and enjoyment. Now, there are a variety of different virtual reality technologies. I'm going to highlight just a couple of them. These are the ones that I'm going to be giving you examples of. So we can have simple desktop video games that because they're a little bit more interactive, they tend to be used with a mouse or a keyboard or a joystick. They're easy to use and have been shown to be quite effective. 
There are the camera tracking technologies like the video that I showed you before where you simply have a 2D or 3D cameras are now available and you can use them to immerse the person, enter his video in real time into any virtual environment and his movement performance is what drives the, the experience. There are head-mounted displays, which now are much, much less encumbering than the one I showed you in the previous video. And they have a built-in tracker so that when the person moves their head to look at different locations in the virtual environment, it's as if they're really looking at those different environments, not as if when they st face straight ahead, they look at the screen. But when they look to the side, they just see the regular room. And I'll show you some examples of that. And then we also have tangible user interfaces, um, a variety of different touch screens, touch tables that you can put in virtual environments on. And we use, we've been using these extensively for children with autism. And I'll be showing you some of those examples. So what the aim is to achieve a high sense of presence, you want to give the feeling to the person that he is behaving in the virtual environment as if it's real without fooling him. But you want to aim for a low cost and technical simplicity because we as therapists cannot afford to be playing with the technology all the time. The technology has to be there to support us. That's why you want low cost so that your administrations will approve it, agree to buy it, which of course is the first hurdle to handle in any case. And it has to be simple technologically so that you're not always having to call someone to fix it because it doesn't work or not having to spend a lot of time to learn how to use it. So we're aiming for those things, but not at the expense of low presence. So you want to give a very high fidelity virtual experience at low cost and technical simplicity. Um, the hype cycle by the Gartner Group is one of the tools that helps us decide when a technology is ripe for use. That means when its time has come. Okay? In the early days of cell phones, I'm, many of you are probably too young to even remember that, but in the 90s when cell phones first came on the market, they had a lot of hype. In other words, they, they were here on the cycle. People had very high expectations for what that technology could deliver. In fact, virtual reality, a little bit later on, also was th at that point on the cycle. And what happens then is people try it, they'll buy something. I remember, I don't want to age myself too much, but I do remember buying one of the very first uh, laptops in 1988. It was, I bought the first Mac laptop, which was a lemon, and I bought the first Windows laptop, which was a little bit less of a lemon, but they were both very heavy. They weighed eight kilogram kilograms. I remember I was at the time living in Canada. I went on a trip from Canada to Israel. I was doing a series of lectures, and I dragged both of those so-called portable laptops with me, and then I discarded them because they just simply were too hyped up. Their, their ability, the ability of the technology to deliver what it was supposed to do was just not there yet. Now what happens then is that many technologies actually then go to this part of the curve. That is, they can deliver more than people expect from them. So someone could then, a couple of years later, have bought a laptop computer, except they were so disappointed from their previous experience that they didn't bother to do it. It takes a while for a technology to actually even out its performance with people's expectations, and that's what's called the plateau. And what we're aiming to do, and what virtual reality has now done, is it has begun to be on the plateau, which means that it is now ripe for use. And I'm going to try to prove that to you, demonstrate that to you, throughout the, ne the, rest, the next part of the talk. Okay, so what are the main issues that we have to address when we're looking at the readiness of a technology to be used clinically? So first of all, we have to ask ourselves, is the technology necessary to achieve a clinical objective? Now, what is this young man doing? He's shaving. How is he shaving? 
in front of a camera. Now, what would be in your mind an easier solution for, sh for shaving? A mirror, right? Now, is it justified to use a webcam to pro broadcast his image onto his computer monitor in order to shave? Okay, that's a little bit of overusage of technology. Okay, that's what? Over, overuse, okay? So we're not aiming to get to using technology where we could find an equally good solution for the clinical problem without that technology. That's number one. Number two, does the technology's intended clinical usage match its affordances, match its characteristics? Okay, what do we have here? We have a woman who's using a computer, right? She's word processing, except how is she trying to correct her mistake? With whiteouts, okay? So obviously there is a mismatch between what the technology can afford, okay? What it can do for us and how the person is using it. We also want to avoid that, okay? That's not the goal either. Um, and then the third and very important question, which unfortunately tends to get a little bit relegated um, as, not that it's not important, but that's just hard to do. The third question is, is there sufficient evidence in the literature to demonstrate the usability and the effectiveness of a technology for rehabilitation? In other words, many products are out on the market. I don't know if you remember the Sony eye toy, I don't know if you remember the Nintendo Wii, which I think actually still has a life. Um, the Sony iToy has now been replaced by what? Microsoft's Kinect. There are many, many products on the market. And I'm not trying to put any of them down. I've used them all. But they came on the market without any demonstration whatsoever of effectiveness. Okay, and it's a big problem. And if you look at the literature, I put a couple, just flashing up a couple of different um, review articles, position papers, meta-analyses. The bottom line is that VR, virtual reality, has not yet been conclusively demonstrated to be effective. There's been a lot of usability studies. That means that you try it out on a number of different people and you show that it can be feasibly used in a clinical situation. There are a number of small sample randomized control trials. So you might have 10 or 20 patients. That's not enough to demonstrate unequivocally that there is effectiveness. But it is a start. So I don't want to be too discouraging about it. But um, the evidence is not yet conclusive. So as much as I believe in the potential of the technology, in none of the studies that I will show you can you say conclusively that it is effective, although the potential is definitely there. Now, I'm, uh, I'm going to actually just go, not over, I just don't want to take too time, much time with the introduction, so I'm just going to go over this part. We can come back to it if we have time. I want to actually start in on the applications. So the first one I'm going to do is on cognitive rehabilitation and use the example of children with attention deficit disorder. I'm going to show you a video clip from uh, Skip Rizzo's lab. Skip Rizzo is one of the pioneers in the applications of, rehabilita of virtual reality for rehabilitation. Uh, he hails from the University of Southern California, and we've had the privilege to do some work with him. So I'll just show you a video. You'll see a virtual classroom. Um, it's taken from the point of view of a child who is sitting right here. You're seeing this from that child's point of view. He's wearing a head-mounted display on his head with a tracker on it so that any movement of his head is being shown to him on a pair of small um, 3D screens that he has right in front of his eyes. Okay, So you can see that he's able to look out the window. Sometimes he'll see something that will distract his attention. What are you supposed to be doing? I'm going to show you that video again because it was pretty short. Okay, what he is supposed to be doing, I guess she can move around here a little bit, right? Uh, well, I'll, I guess I can't. Uh, what he's supposed to be doing is looking at the, at the blackboard, it's okay, 
He's looking at the blackboard here. There's, you see that there's letters that are flashing up? This is a test of vigilance, of his attention. Um, if those of you may be familiar with the TOVA, I'll show it a little bit of it to you later. It's, it's, it's a test of attention. And what happens is every time the child looks away from the blackboard, he misses the letters that are sequencing through it. And he is supposed to be keeping track of which letters follow which other letters because sometimes he's supposed to press a buzzer to say that it happened. And sometimes he's not supposed to do that. So he can either make errors of omission because he missed a certain sequence, or he can make errors of commission when he pressed the button when he shouldn't have done so. Okay? So every time there's a distraction, he is going to have the potential to miss part of the test and not perform as well as he should. Um, so what you, I'm just showing you here at the bottom are um, a couple of different screenshots from the classroom. You can see that there are various different kinds of stimuli. There's a pa paper airplane that one child can shoot across the room so it'll come flying over the head of that uh, child. Um, there can be two children that can be talking to each other, whispering or passing a note. You can have someone enter the room from outside the corridor and make a clicking sound with their feet as they're entering the room, or you can have cars moving. Now the therapist, uh, outside the window, the therapist is able to control how many of those stimuli there will be during the test and when they will occur. That's all completely under the therapist's control. Now, I want to show you the result of one test like that with two children. I'm just going to stop it first. What you see on the left-hand side is a child who is typically developing no symptoms of attention deficit disorder at all. On this side here, you see a, the representation, by that's a representation, an avatar of the child. ADHD did. Now we're after a minute and a half. Now we're after five minutes. Okay, now it's becoming a real challenge for the child with ADHD. The other child is also moving a little bit, but this, the child with ADHD has really become a little bit um, thrown by, by the test. Uh, man walking by again. It's becoming, we're now at what, five minutes and 20 seconds. The child is spending more time not looking at the screen than they are looking at the blackboard. Now the child pretty well has had it, okay? It's very, very difficult now for that child to keep his head up straight. And in fact, now you see one of those paper airplanes flying overhead. Well, that child is tracking that stimulus completely faithfully, okay? So it's little wonder that children are performing at a much lower level because they're constantly being distracted. Now, the virtual classroom is a much more um, ecologically valid, that is more close to real classroom behavior than the test of the TOVA. This is what I mentioned to you before, where in the test of uh, the TOVA, the test of everyday attention, uh, you have um, a little black square that is at the top of the screen or at the bottom of the screen. And again, the child is supposed to be looking at that and pressing a, a beeper whenever that um, square is in a different location. Now, we did a study together with colleagues at one of the uh, hospitals in uh, Jerusalem, Shari Tzedek Hospital, to compare the performance of children with ADHD um, using the VR as a test of attention and to show how sensitive it was to the main treatment, Ritalin, that is used for these children. We want to compare the ability of this virtual reality environment to, to compare to the way the TOVA works, because the TOVA is the gold standard for use in this area. And what we were able to do, we, we showed again, uh, uh, not a huge group of children, of 27 boys with ADHD. They did three different sessions, all in a counterbalanced way, where they had either the, the virtual reality um, and two different non-virtual reality paradigms. One was the TOVA. 
Um, the testing was take, take, took place one hour after the ingestion of either a placebo or 0.3 milligrams per kilogram of MPH. Uh, sorry, CPT is a, a computer, computerized performance test. So it just means one of those automated tests of performance, and virtual reality is considered to be an example of that. Sorry. Um, hmm? Okay, so that Ritalin. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay, it's Ritalin. Okay. Um, so what we found is that Ritalin, as is quite well known, reduced the omission errors. Okay. Um, it reduced them more so when we use VR as compared to the TOVA. Okay, so the performance was even better than the TOVA. But what was even more important, and that's the last point that you see here, is that the children enjoyed it much more. They were much more compliant to doing the test than they are with the really, un unfortunately, very boring TOVA test. And so what we felt that we demonstrated here was not only was it effective in showing the um, the ability of the Ritalin to improve the child's attention ability, but also that it was more effective than the standard test that's used, and in a way that was much more enjoyable for the children. Okay, now what an added advantage of using this kind of virtual classroom is that the children were able to participate in the design of it. So this here is, was the first teacher that they had in the virtual classroom. And the kids just hated her. They thought that she was mean. Look at her. I mean, she just doesn't look very friendly. So we went back to the, the programmers and gave them this feedback. And who did they come up with? Barbie, OK? <laughs> they, went, uh, they swung a little bit too far <laughs> to making someone attractive, pleasant, who knows what. Finally, after enough feedback, this is the version that Skip Rizzo's group came up with. So you have like this modification between the very mean looking teacher, the Barbie teacher, who's not very realistic, and a real flesh and blood uh, teacher, although she's virtual. So what was the added value of virtual reality is that you could go in and request changes that were in accordance with the preference of the children. And when I was referring at the beginning of my talk to empowerment, that's exactly what we mean. So that people who are the users of rehabilitation have an effect on the way that it's given. Okay, I wanna now move to another application, motor rehabilitation, and use the cerebral palsy as a group. And use a different technology, this time the camera tracking. Uh, we developed, this is uh, the paper, one of the papers that we published on it, a meal maker. The idea was to give children with cerebral palsy an opportunity to train their upper extremities and sitting balance while they were taking place in an interesting for them uh, environment and a task that was meaningful to them. They were making meals and we were also able to put on electrodes to measure their heart rate variability as well as their galvanic skin response to measure their physiological responses to when they had unpleasant events happen or pleasant events happen during the therapy. So we wanted to see how much we could have an effect on their emotional responses while doing therapy. Well, we have an example here of a couple of meals. I'm gonna show you a short video on this. So you have here a child with cerebral palsy She's facing a camera, which is putting her into an environment. Now it's not a game environment like we saw in the previous video. Uh, she has shells that have products on them. She's selected to do a, make an omelette. So she has to choose the correct ingredients in the correct order for making the omelette. And if she's correct, she gets a little bit of nice feedback. You can see that she's enjoying it. Now we also, she gets to choose which meals she wants to make. Now she's chosen to make a sandwich. And what we sometimes do is we have distractors. So for example, not everything that she's choosing there belongs to, to uh, um, uh, making a sandwich. So she'll, she's made a mistake now. She's chosen the toothpaste or, uh, or a cream. 
okay? And we're able to give her the feedback to help her improve. Unfortunately, I don't have here a video to show the negative stimuli that were put in, but we did see a very, very strong response in terms of the physiological measures being able to pick up her behavioral responses. Okay, so just to, to summarize, you see the, the groups that we had there. We had 15 children with cerebral palsy uh, compared to 19 typically developing children. Uh, they were, the children with cerebral palsy had different levels of impairment uh, according to the GMFCS. Uh, some of them were mild, mildly impaired to being quite severely impaired to children in that category. And um, what we, as I said, said, that they found the meal maker to be user friendly, an enjoyable way to get therapy, and also feasible to be able to test their physiological responses to therapy. And these were the two keys that we were aiming for in the development of this uh, paradigm. They were also sensitive to differences in performance between typically developing children and children with cerebral palsy. Okay, I'd like to now move on to the uh, multi-user touch surfaces um, and I'm going to give an application uh, of social interaction for children with autism spectrum disorder. And basically what our aim here is to take advantage of the interest that children with autism have in using computers. Okay, you can really sit a child with autism facing a computer, doing a video game and they will do it a lot of hours of the day. What's the problem with that, however? What is that exactly encouraging? We know they have the skills, but they're doing that to the detriment of interacting with other people. Okay, so what were, the challenge here for using technology was to harness the power of technology without having the downside that it would, in fact, detract from social interaction. And so what we did was we took advantage of the Diamond Touch table. Uh, the Diamond Touch is a multi-user table, and that's a very important point. Most touch surfaces, your iPads, for example, or Microsoft's um, touch table, they're multi-touch, but they're not multi-user. And the difference is that multi-touch means that I can touch the surface with one hand or two hands. You and I can touch the surface, but the surface doesn't know, doesn't differentiate between the fact that sometimes it's me and myself, and sometimes it's me and another person. The diamond touch, because it's configured, as you can see here, it's got a capacitative response. The children sit on pads and it, that which connect them directly to that capacitative response that's just embedded here underneath the, the surface so that the table is in fact able to recognize up to eight different people who are using it. We typically use it with three people, two children and one adult who is the facilitator and she typically or he is the occupational therapist or teacher. Okay, so we have now an affordance, a characteristic of a technology, multi-touch, which we translate into a paradigm <coughs> that enables us to encourage, in fact, I'm going to use a word that doesn't sound so good from a PR, public, public relations point of view, but in fact it's what it really is. We enforce collaboration, okay? We use the technology to actually make the children collaborate with each other, because if they don't do something together, they can't do the game. They can't just do it by themselves. And what we, I'll show you some videos of this. We try then to train them to help them improve their social interaction. And then very importantly, we look to see if that's transferred into their ability to interact when they're not using the technology. There's never a point in using a technology for its own sake. It's only if you get transferred to other accomplishments afterwards without being dependent upon the technology that there was any point to it. Okay, so the first application we did, and this was done in collaboration with colleagues in Italy, uh, in Trento, Italy. 
um, was that we had a co-located story. There was a storytelling um, activity that children took turns telling a story using the diamond touch table. And uh, you can see here, um, they have a background. This is the Jungle Book. It's taken from that. We have a number of different backgrounds, which the children jointly select by pointing on one of the bigger beetles. So when they touch it together, they, the beetle opens up, and they're able to choose which story background they want to tell a story about. Now, it's very important that the children have the ability to do that together because if one child alone could choose the story background, that would make the other child have to cooperate with him in a way that he maybe didn't choose to do. They then can open another beetle which has all sorts of figures, for example, Mowgli and different people, different figures, characters from the Jungle Book or depending on what background it is, the figures will be appropriate for that background. They then have these smaller beetles, either the blue ones or the purple ones, which each child can activate on his own. And I say his because we did, there's a much larger number of boys with autism than girls, and so we restricted our study to only boys so that we wouldn't confound it by mixing the genders. So what happens is that each child then drags his little beetle to a virtual microphone and he can then record his story. He record like Mowgli went out to the jungle to da 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 da. Okay. He then places it on the storyboard here. The next child, the second child, then takes his little beetle, puts it on the microphone, and records the next segment in the story, and then drags it to the storyboard, and it will be located here. And then the first child will do his and so on and so on until they complete the story. So they're sharing an activity. Some of it they have to do together. They have to jointly select the uh, backgrounds, jointly select the virtual figures, and jointly play back the story once they've said it. But they also have individual activities that they can do because you should never make somebody only do something with someone else, okay? So we try to give them both joint interactions to encourage their social behavior, but at the same time recognize that they are individuals. So we tested to see how effective a three-week intervention, we took the, ta the diamond touch table, it's a fairly large table, we took it to one of the autism schools in northern Israel and we had pairs of children who were matched. They were high-functioning children, children with high-functioning autism, uh, eight to nine years old. Uh, they, were in, they were in a mainstream school, but in special classes. And we, before we did the intervention, we tested their ability to interact. We did that by giving two different tests. One was, I don't know if you're familiar with it, Discovery Toys Marble Works. It's a game, it's a Lego-like game. It's excellent for documenting um, children's ability to interact with each other. And basically, they're given all of these pieces, and they were told to together make a structure that they could then run marbles down and play with it. As you'll see in a, in a video shortly, um, they were able to build but they did it separately. It's as if, for them, just sitting together like you see them there on the floor in their classroom was being together. They're in the same location, they're doing the same activity, but they were not interacting. Another um, way to measure the effectiveness of the technology was to give a low technology version of it. What we did is we printed out on large pieces of Bristol board the story backgrounds and also the individual characters for each story. And then we had a little audio recorder where they were, could record in turn their stories. <coughs> so basically we were having the same activity that they were being trained in with using the touch table, but in a completely non-technology <coughs> format, okay? So we have something that involves storytelling but no technology and something that involves interacting, a game, with no technology. So we're using those two to see if there's an improvement as a result of using the technology. 
So I'm gonna show you, it's a very quick video, it's just one minute. First of all, you'll see how they're using the Marble Works game before they had the intervention. So they're able to do the activity, but they do not do it together. Okay. Okay, they're just each build, taking little pieces, building them up on their own, and really have nothing to do with each other. I just want to now show you again a very brief segment of the intervention using the diamond touch table. Okay, that's the table, and you can see they now want to hear the story together, so they're doing the joint touch, and they're interacting. You see they're looking at each other with a smile. We documented all of the different positive and negative social behaviors to see how much in their improvement there was as a result of using the technology. This is after it, and we tested this both in the pairs that they had learned together with, as well as in different pairs, and they have learned how to interact using that technology. So um, if you want any more specific results, we have um, a number of papers that we've published on it, but basically we were extremely encouraged to see the power of a technology to affect social interaction and to transfer <coughs> into other activities that were not dependent upon the technology. The problem with that one was that it was only for children who could speak, so they had to be high functioning. And we wanted to be able to, en to encourage collaboration using a technology, but without having to require the children to speak. So we have a different collaborative game. This is called the collaborative puzzle game, which is also being used with the uh, diamond touch table. This time it's being used with a therapist. And you can see here that what happens is there's a puzzle on the table and it now uh, breaks up into little pieces and there are joint touches. You see the therapist is together with the child touching it together to now form the puzzle again. So this is an activity that again supports joint action through touch but does not require language ability. So we have both a high functioning paradigm as well as a low functioning paradigm to be encouraging social interaction. In this particular case it's with a therapist but we also have many uh, studies where the two children are interacting together and again showing a transfer of abilities after the table is not being used. Okay, uh, that's just, okay, the article, um, if anybody wants the, a copy of the, of the PowerPoint, I'm more than happy to send it to you, and uh, then you can have the, um, the references that are there. Okay, this, was, this all, the ones I just showed you now all took place about um, six years ago, and then after that, because we were so gratified with the um, effectiveness of the technology, we started to work with our Italian co colleagues as well as a group, uh, two groups from uh, the United Kingdom to develop a technology that was based on cognitive behavioral therapy for children with high functioning autism. So um, those of you in psychology for sure know this, I'm sure many of the others of you also know it, but basically um, cognitive behavioral therapy is based on learning and experiencing. So you want to use techniques such as concept clarification to help a child, or an adult for that matter, improve their abilities. In our case, it was in social interaction. And you want to also be able to give them the experience of doing that, a behavioral change, such as role playing, or um, uh, giving feedback reinforcement. So the idea is to combine the two. Now CBT has been shown to be quite effective for children with autism in terms of their social interaction abilities, but until we did our study it had not been used with technology. So our challenge was to see how a technology could help. And we did that by again having that joint interaction, but this time we expanded it to not only being joint performance, touching at the same time, so that we have an apple orchard. I'll show you an example of that. We also did it by having different kinds of techniques for, uh, for sharing and negotiating and also for mutual planning. So we expanded the repertoire of interactions from being just joint action to being planning 
and to being um, negotiating and compromising through sharing objects. So the paradigm is again using the diamond touch table. We actually have some modifications of it afterwards that I'll tell you about. There's a teacher or a therapist and two children who are interacting. And the way that the program is designed is that you can very easily go back and forth from the cognitive point to the experience point in the software. Because the whole basis of CBT is to be able to go back at will between the two, depending upon the needs of the person that is being treated. So um, I just want to show you, first of all, concept clarification through uh, the, co the cognitive part. So there were a series of social vignettes, stories, that had related to problems. So one of the problems was that um, a mother wants to make jam. So she sends her children out to the apple orchard so that they can bring back apples, enough apples for her to make jam. This is all told to the children in a, in a nice story way. I have them in Hebrew, so I'm not going to, um, I'll just tell you the story rather than that you hear it. Uh, the problem is that the children face is that they can't carry back that uh, container full of apples on their own. It's too heavy for either one of them to take back. So how do they solve that problem? How are they going to collect enough apples and carry them back home to their mother? So there are certain responses that we prepared for them in advance, plus they're able to record um, their own responses if they wish. So one response is that, well, we, it's too heavy for us, we'll just eat some apples and that's it. You know, poor mother won't have her apple pie. Um, or, what's another thing? Well, we can call grandpa to come and help us. But what's the problem with choosing it that way? Well, um, grandpa's a little bit old and he lives far away, so by the time he comes, it's gonna be the next day. Or, well, one of us can just try and do it by ourselves, but we know it's too heavy, we're not gonna succeed in that way. Or we can just each carry back as many as we can carry in our hands, but then there won't be enough apples. So we have all of these non-appropriate social solutions, and then there's the appropriate one, which means that, well, we can collaborate. We can work together to carry back that pail full of apples, and then mother will have enough apples to make jam from. Okay, so those are the different kinds of social situations that the children discuss with each other and they can be pointing and doing things. But that's all at the cognitive level. We want to also get, enable them to get to the behavioral level and that's by having a game. So here's the apple orchard game where apples are falling down from the apple tree and what happens is, is that one of the children on their own moves the basket, the virtual basket, back and forth, it will not respond very well and they won't be able to win the game. But if they both jointly run that, uh, move the um, apple basket, the container, back and forth, it will respond very easily and they'll be able to succeed. So the concept of sharing the load of the apple container is reinforced by the experience of the game as it was clarified in the concept during the solving of the social vignettes. Okay, that's the idea of the CBT approach. And sometimes the therapist is able to start with the game to illustrate what is collaboration and then get to the, to the concept clarification and sometimes back and forth. It doesn't have to be in any specific order and the software supports that. Now, there's two other games in this series. One is the bridge. The bridge falls apart and some of the pieces that belong to this person's side of the bridge fell on this side, and some of the pieces of this person's bridge fell on this side. And so what happens is they have to ask each other to send over by this transport cable pieces of the bridge. So what we're doing now is they're sharing objects, and th it doesn't matter what, no matter what this child does, if he puts his finger over on this side, that piece will not respond because the diamond touch table is able to recognize, well, that's not your side of the bridge. So you can only get the pieces that you need to solve the puzzle here 
if you ask your peer to send them over and vice versa. This one on this side can only get them if he asks his peer to send them over to this side. So again, we're reinforcing, and there's a whole series of, I don't have time for it, but there's a whole series of, of story vignettes that support what happens when a bridge falls down. And also we have a game called Alien. In this case, there's mutual planning because each child has his own role to play. One child moves a boat that is supposed to collect stars. The other child is releasing the stars. The child that's running the boat has to collect the stars in order to take it to the alien spaceship. Once he gets enough stars, he's able to fly home. Okay? Now, by the way, we did all of this with participatory design, and so that the children played a, a complete role in um, designing the software and giving us feedback as it was being played. So they found these games to be quite enjoyable. In fact, here you have the results of the intrinsic motivation inventory. It's a well-known test to show um, uh, interest that the children have in games, how competent they feel when using them. Do they feel that they have a uh, perceived choice in what they do? And also, do they feel not too much tension? And so we were very pleased to see that we have a high level of interest competence and perceived choice and yet very little tension that they, that they felt. And just to show you the power of the participatory design, the children hated the apple jam making game. Why did they hate it? Because they said, my mother doesn't make jam. It was completely unrealistic to them. They said, if we need jam in the house, mom goes out and buys it in the store. But, on the other hand, it was their suggestion, one thing that we need a lot of in Israel is rain. And so what we did is we changed the game to be raindrops instead of apple orchard. And now the children had to solve the problem of how to collect enough rain. Okay? And so, we, in fact, we didn't have to change the software except for a little bit of the graphics there. But again, it, just to prove the point of how important it is to have participatory design when you're using these... Um, software, and we've done that for adults as well when we do different things for stroke, etc. Uh, because then it means that the software will be, or the technology will be meaningful to the user. And I would just like to show you an example of two of the children performing with the different games. These are two children with high functioning autism. I hope it'll work. Hello? No, that's too important not to show. Okay, here. What does it say there? Runtime error? No. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. What did he say? Oh, quick time. Oh. Maybe, but I, it's my own computer. <laughs> Just one second. Just a sec. I just, I just want to take a second to, you know. just, just in case it works this way, let's just see. Yeah, book, okay, great. Okay, so these are two children with high functioning autism using the touch table. They're using the uh, raindrops game. This is before we did the change. Okay, you can see how naturally they're interacting with each other. They're pointing, they're doing things together appropriately. This is the bridge game. They're obviously really enjoying it. They're telling each other, encouraging each other. You can't see her very well, but the therapist is sitting here running control over it. And she's, you know, sometimes she has to intervene a little bit, but she's letting the technology drive the process. Now, if you can accomplish that, I think that that's a lot to say, that the children not only enjoyed it individually, but they enjoyed it as a pair together. Okay, this is the alien game that you're seeing here. And they're really involved, really motivated to do it. Here, there's, you see the social vignettes where they're having to problem solve, being guided by the therapist, but basically they get to choose of the different responses. Okay. I know I'm, whoops, sorry. 
how, ten minutes? How much more time now? Just tell me how much time? Ten. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to move on a little faster. Just a sec. Okay, that's just some of our papers on it. I won't show you this. Uh, okay, so my concluding remarks. Okay, so we saw some examples of the technology. We want to try to learn some lessons from that to make the right clinical deci uh, decisions. And it's important to identify the trade-offs between the technology affordances, what the technology can do for us, and therapeutic constraints. What are our goals uh, clinically? So one of the issues is availability. The Diamond Touch, I think I've tried to demonstrate to you, is a very nice technology. But it's big. And it's expensive. It costs $10,000. So it's not something that we can afford to have in every school or every clinical. What? No, no, we're talking about the cost. Ah, yeah, that's a lot, right? You know, I'm not going to ask you to take any school. However, what we did, we recognized the cost. And in fact, when we did the participatory design, we didn't only do it with the children. We did it with groups of teachers and therapists. And we got that feedback that this is very nice, but there's no way we're ever going to be able to afford it. And so what we developed was a multi-mice version. Until Windows 8, you could attach as many mice as you want to a computer, but they all controlled the same cursor. With Windows 8, there's a special feature that's available free of charge so that you can put it as many mice as you have people using it. In our case, we did three because we had the therapist and two children. And the whole entire software can be run with just mice. Okay, that doesn't cost very much money, right? And so we are able to make a technology or um, the way it's applied much cheaper. <coughs> And now we're working towards doing it with iPads so that each child will have his own iPad and be able to see what each other is doing. And so availability is an extremely important clinical issue. Encumbrance, as I mentioned before, that was the first head-mounted display that was used. I think it weighs more than the child's head, okay? But that was the first one that we used with children with autism, by the way, by Dorothy Strickland. She did beautiful pioneering work. It was 20 years ago. But you would never use it now because now that's the next version. But now you have these very small glasses that you can use. So the virtual classroom, for example, can be used quite readily and they don't, they don't even cost that much. Cost, of course, is a huge issue. Um, so there are many very expensive systems, um, but there are also some very cheap systems. The Connect. Now, the Connect, I mentioned before, as being a technology that's off the shelf that hasn't been proven in its own right to be effective. But it comes with a software developer's kit, which means that it can be adapted quite nicely for therapy. But I want to just show you what happens when you have a technology. Um, and if you have a good therapist, they will know how to adapt it. We're seeing here a child with cerebral palsy who's using the eye toy. That's the precursor from the, the Connect. OK, camera-based technology. And just look at what's happening. Those of you who are therapists will cringe when you see her because, in fact, she's being encouraged. We'll get to her in a second again. You can see the really very, very poor movement patterns. Is that something that you're giving a child therapy to accomplish? Probably not, okay? I mean, I can drag myself on the floor without having any kind of therapy, you know. So that's not what you want to do. So what that therapist did, she's the therapist is trying to encourage her to get up, um, is that simply the use of a constraint, such as a stool, okay? So the therapist is telling the child to put her foot on the stool. It then constrains her movement patterns. So she's using a technology that has not been adapted for therapy, but in the hands of a, of a therapist who knows how to think properly, you can use it properly nevertheless, okay? It's not ideal, but it can be done. So sometimes off the shelf can work, but in the hands of a good therapist. OK, technology pen penetration. Here what you can see, as in Western countries, I don't know what you're considered to be Western or not, but, you're, but South America, unfortunately, is over here. So I'm not quite sure if this is accurate or not, but it's fairly recently published. Um, there's not as much technology usage in certain countries around the world 
as there is in Western countries and in Israel. In Israel, you see a lot of use of different kinds of technologies. So I think when we, we start to consider this, we have to consider what part of the world we're dealing with and to look at ways to use the cheaper technologies that would be more available. And technology robustness. We don't want to spend our time as therapists fighting with the technology. So we have to make sure that, remember what I told you about the Gartner hype cycle? That we're located on the plateau so that the technology is reliable, <coughs> it's robust, it works when we want it to work, we don't have to fight with it. And then creating simulations at, world, at will. I don't have time for it. I don't also have an internet connection here. But I, I invite you to go to look at Google Maps Sphere. You can now use your phone. I don't know where mine went to. But you can use your phone and click it. It instructs you how to click it at this level, above and below. And you will create a simulation within 10 seconds. So there are more and more tools now out that are make it possible to do s virtual simulations in a much uh, easier way than it was in the past. Okay, and these are just some examples of some of the simulations that we've used. Okay, so um, my take home message is the following. I don't know if you've uh, heard of, in, in marketing there's a concept of a stretch target, okay? Like this woman here has really, I think, achieved a pretty good stretch. And uh, <laughs> I would like to aim to be able to do that. A stretch target in marketing terms is identifying a target that is currently out of reach, OK? I can't do that, OK? But I bet if I really aim to do it, it's not out of sight for me. In other words, it's achievable. Not today, not tomorrow, but it is achievable. So what we're trying to do is we take technologies and make stretch targets for ourselves. They may not be the same stretch targets for all of us. It depends on where we're from. It depends on what clinical field we're in. It depends on what, we, what application, what kind of clinical population we're working with. But we should try to identify a stretch target that's a little bit above our comfort level, not too, too above it, a little bit above it, so that we can aim to increase our capacity for therapy, OK? And I invite any of you who, who would wish to be in touch with me. Many of the software that I described to you is free of charge. It does require a little bit of uh, playing with because it's free of charge. It doesn't come on a CD necessarily. But any of you who wish contact for further information, I would be more than happy to uh, collaborate. And I thank you all for your attention. So after this excellent presentation, we have some time for questions or comments. Anybody wishing to ask a question, please raise your hand and we'll pass the mic to you. Look, this is very interesting, but not specifically what I'm looking for. I have come with my own child, and what I need is to have some augmentative communicational program uh, with a tablet. What I find, I cannot uh, set or configure. So. I need uh, pictures that are familiar to him and something very simple because what you've shown is for high functioning uh, children. I need something much more basic. Can you recommend me maybe a site and something very simple for parents too? Yeah, I'm still connected. Uh, I don't want to hear myself. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, but I won't remember them. No, I know I won't remember. I'll do it quickly, though, okay? Um, 
I, uh, I'm sorry there was a little bit of a mismatch between what you wanted. Uh, I have a colleague who's quite an expert, uh, Dr. Tali Label in, uh, from Israel, who's an expert. She's a speech and ther uh, pathologist and uses uh, iPads extensively for children with, with uh, different levels of functioning of autism. I'd be very happy to give you her, or to put you in touch with her, and I believe that she would be able to help you. So it's not my particular field, but I would be, uh, I think that she would be a good help to you, and I'm sure she would cooperate. So just make sure to get my email or give me yours, and within the next few days, I will help you through her. Good evening. Let me first thank you and congratulate you for your excellent presentation. Question. This type of therapies are applied in both public and private institutions? Uh, in Israel, we have um, social medicine. Uh, there are private hospitals. Uh, but most have some level of government funding, and uh, the schools are all um, public. Uh, and um, it's very, in Israel for sure, it's very widely used. I'm also familiar with Canada and the States. These technologies are quite widely used um, um, at different levels. Um, Muchísimas okay. gracias. Okay. Thank you. Congratulations for your presentation. It was really very comprehensive. I was interested in two things. One, this idea of uh, too high expectations on uh, a specific technology, particularly when you have impaired children. So what other therapy one might need in order to make adjustments regarding the expectations one has on certain technologies and the cost. Because I believe that when there's a great impairment, sometimes the market offers lots of things which are very costly and that will not respond or com to those expectations and there's much disappointment. So what you brought here with this idea of the graph and the plateau is fundamental from the therapeutical point of view for psychotherapists and their work with parents and with the children. So perhaps you could expand a bit more on that. And another question is uh, the, the diagnosis. What thing for who? <laughs> I know I won't remember a second question, so let me just answer that first. Um, actually, I think you summarized it extremely well. <laughs> there, there's a, uh, unfortunately, there is so much technology available, it's very hard to keep track of it. Um, one good thing, I don't know if you have it here, but with, there's a many, many conferences on this field, and it's a matter, I think it's, a, it's, are you coming from a clinical background? Yeah. So it's, there's... Also research. Also? Research. Research, but okay, okay, but I was wondering if you were a parent, like in terms of a yeah. child with special needs. Um, I, I think the, it just requires a lot of networking. Networking through reading the literature, through speaking to people and attending conferences. Um, we have, there's an international society for virtual reality, virtual rehabilitation actually, um, where people can pose questions. I, it just a matter of getting the knowledge out there and not being overhyped by the companies. The companies, Microsoft spends billions, I don't know if billions, but millions on advertising the Connect. But it's not always the, usable without adaptations. And we have to be careful of that. So it's, uh, there's a lot of literature though. I'm very happy to share. I have many, many articles, not just, I mean, not my own. I put a whole bunch up here of other peoples that have done reviews and uh, position papers to exactly address that, that issue. It's just a matter of becoming more and more aware of it. The challenge is that the technologies change all the time. It's not like you can just master a technology and then you're done. Because 
every day there's new ones coming out. So, well, the second question, the second question is. Second question. The diagnosis is to be who is to diagnose the psychologist and who decides the treatment for each child and at what point. Does a psychologist do that? Is it a very specialized psychologist in such technologies in order to recommend such and such a technology for therapy? Because you have different levels. You have the psychological level, the psychotherapeutical level, and the technology. So how, you, how do you combine all those things together? Uh, you use the word diagnose. Well, I heard the word diagnosis. I'm not sure if that's what the word you use, but um, Diagnosis is not done by, in our country, by therapists, okay? I'm, so e either by the physician or by the psychologist. But then the therapist, at whichever level, the psychologist or the th occupational therapist or physical therapist, will then design the treatment intervention based on that professional's knowledge of the field. So a diagnosis doesn't necessarily mandate a specific therapeutic approach. Some people could use CBT and other people maybe not. Um, you know, you could, you could choose to have a different clinical approach for the same diagnosis. And that's the, the, also true for technology. So I don't, I'm not sure, it would really be a very, um, again, a matter of being aware of the different options, looking at the literature, where the evidence is convincing, and unfortunately, there's still not very, large samples, research studies, but the numbers are getting higher and it's, it's becoming uh, more encouraging. But it's still um, a little bit of a hit and miss, unfortunately. Uh, One second. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Question. Were these technologies thought for education too, and for the for for example, autistic children that attend to normal schools and interact with uh, no, normal quote unquote children? It's an excellent question. Um, uh, I didn't have time to go into that whole area of it. I don't know if you noticed, but we have a center of excellence for um, educational technology. And uh, we have a whole other series of studies that address exactly what you said now. But if you write to me, I'll be happy to share what we have on it. But it wasn't part Thank of you. this presentation. There's a lot. There's more done in education than in therapy using technologies. Thank you. OK. How can one adapt these technologies to other cultural environments? And can we bring initiatives from other cultures in order to interact with your labs, for example? Do you think uh, we can bring projects or initiatives from here because of the actual needs we have here and take them back to your lab. I will take them to your lab. I don't... From here to there or from yes. there to here? No. <laughs> initiatives, as, as the children proposed different initiatives, yes. professional from here can ask and propose uh, to you different initiatives to develop there okay. in Israel. Okay. Um, we, today we've worked very extensively, as I mentioned, with um, colleagues in Italy and in the United Kingdom, and we did come across some cultural differences. Um, so to some extent it was um, related to how therapists, the role of therapists, and, and how empowered they are. Um, in Israel, therapists tend to be very, very active, a little bit less so in Italy. Um, but overall, we found that uh, when the British groups came and tried out their software in Israel and vice versa, 
we found them to be quite robust. So, um, I mean, I welcome co collaborations. As I said, almost all of the software that I presented is free of charge. It just requires, I don't want to minimize though when I say this, any kind of interaction and collaboration requires effort on both sides. Um, because any clinician, as you know, is immersed in their daily work. And it takes a lot of energy to do that daily work. And it's sometimes very hard, and I'm thinking of the school, the wonderful school that I saw uh, that Carlos is directing, and I see how hardworking the staff were. That, um, and just imagine if we would now you know, bring a table or even the multi-mouse version, and one of the therapists there, once somebody would have to take upon themselves to make sure that things are running, and whether we wanted to do it in a research way or not, I'm not sure, you know, clinically or not, it requires a certain amount of effort. And unfortunately, we're so busy clinically dealing with the day-to-day -day requirements of therapy, it's hard to afford the time. So what we've done in the past is we've gotten funding from the European Union or from different other sources to be able to hire spe therapists that would be especially given that job of doing it. So my answer, Moti, is that if we can find funding, then, that, then it's realistic to collaborate. We can start doing some very initial things, but from my own experience, unless you have a designated therapist that has the time to use these things, or a psychologist, whichever background you're from, it probably won't happen because they're just too busy doing all the other important things that have to be done. So I think what the first thing to do for any kind of collaboration is to aim for a proposal to get some pilot funding and then to start from there. But I would be very happy to see if any of the things that we've done or to change some of the things to make them work here. I believe that after this fantastic presentation, we have a common goal and that is think how we can uh, raise uh, funds, whether they come from Argentina, from Israel, or from other countries, and to work out a plan of action so that this not only remains as something like wishful thinking, but rather try to make it more tangible. Yeah. Thank you so much. Find a way to be able to collaborate. <laughs> Nos vamos a esforzar para poder pasar la, la pared juntos. Bueno, muchas gracias. Thank you very, very much.